Hi everyone, thanks. Uh, I've got a lot to get through. Normally this is a 50 minute talk, but I've got to squish it into 45, so I'll see if I can do that as fast as possible. Um, so I'm just going to give a few quick words about me. My name's James Mallison. I'm a software engineer from England, but I now work in uh, Mallorca with Trivago. Uh, I tweet about PHP 6, other stuff like that. I uh, tweet anything that takes the, the mickey out of JavaScript and PHP. I also love PHP so much that I got this uh, license plate for my bike, J77PHP. Uh, this, is, this is a true story. I was advised not to drop it for the sake of the PHP community because then JavaScript developers wouldn't, will never hear the, I'll never hear the end of it, right? And then obviously here's me having crashed it a few weeks later in a motorcycle accident. And uh, I work with, uh, so I sold it, I work with all these awesome people at Trivago. Look, here's me at the back, smiling. Uh, this wasn't, we weren't forced to do this, we were actually a happy bunch of crazy people and we all have a good time. So we might also be hiring, so if you think you could slot anywhere in here, I have to say this because Trivago sent me, uh, then uh, talk to me afterwards. And today I'm going to talk about dependency injection and dependency inversion in PHP. I'm not just going to talk about kind of the, the theory behind it, I'm going to show some examples of it and how you can actually do the patterns themselves from the beginning of your application. Um, and by the end, you should have enough knowledge, if you don't already, to know what a dependency injection container is, what a dependency injector is, exactly how they work, so you could even write your own. In fact, there's a few slides in here where we kind of start to do that. Um, but first, I kind of want to explain why. What's the point of me doing this talk? Why is this important? This stuff's been around for years. It's, it's not even new. But as we know, PHP has a really low barrier to entry, and that's okay. Um, but it's really easy, relatively easy to start working with PHP which means we get loads of new devs all the time that kind of just jump into using a framework before they even know the language. So we still need to show how things are supposed to be done. I gave this talk for the first time in 2015, kind of the beginning of the talk's easy stuff, then it goes to some of the mid-level stuff and towards the end it's kind of more of the, more of the advanced stuff, or it was then. So some of the stuff towards the end was kind of new, but now it's more like a history of where we've come from and, uh, and where we are now, because some of these are commonplace now in modern frameworks, especially with Symfony 3.3, which I point out towards the end. Um, and even as we move away from frameworks to more componentized parts of the application, uh, wiring this stuff together becomes important as well. So, uh, so it's just as relevant back then when I did this for the first time and I was really nervous and I had a load of beer to, to make me feel better and I got a bit drunk. And now, uh, and, and towards, and it will continue to be for some time. So even when it becomes more commonplace in PHP and another language comes out and new developers start on that language, there's always going to be people who have to kind of stand up and, and say, look, this is how we do things throughout all languages and not just in PHP, for example. So in order to understand DI, there, there are a load of things that go hand in hand with it. So you've got object-oriented programming, you've got the dependency inversion principle, inversion of control, dependency injection containers, solid testing, all this other stuff. In order to be, write testable code, you've typically got to use the dependency inversion principle and, and use dependency injection. So these, these things kind of go hand in hand. Um, so I'm going to try and aim to remove the fog of war around some of these things that, that seem really hard to understand and kick off with a, a mnemonic acronym that's, that will be thrown at you time and time again in any object-oriented language, not just PHP, and that is SOLID. So SOLID stands for the five basic principles of object-oriented programming and design. In the year 2000, it was conceived by uh, Uncle Bob Martin, the co-founder of the Agile Manifesto. Now, don't forget that this is the year 2000, right? So which is five years after Java 1 came out. I think that was Java Oak or something. I'm too, I'm too young for this. Um, but it's only, or at least I like to think I am, and it was only four years before PHP 5 came out. PHP 5 was the object-oriented one when you typically would start to, this was starting to be pushed in PHP land. So my point here is that, sure, topics like dependency injection and solid existed way before PHP, but because PHP likes to steal the best things from other programming languages, which is also fine because we're all doing this together, it's a community-driven thing, then, uh, then it took a while for us to catch up, and that's okay. So the point of SOLID basically, why we have these principles is if you adhere to them, it basically means you're more likely to be able to confidently, confidently make changes somewhere in the code base without affecting something somewhere else, one of the side effects. So one of the, the worst positions to be in, which I have been in, is you, you come to a company, you're shown a legacy code base by some architect who has a few million lines of code and everything's all coupled together, there's no test, it's a nightmare and it would cost hundreds of thousands of euros in development effort to turn around. So we can at least mitigate, not remove, but mitigate some of the technical debt by adhering to some of these principles. And there's a reason they were created in the first place. Um, there's a pattern out there which I'll talk about in a second, which is one of the main points of this talk. But uh, before we dive into the code, I'm going to give a use case, and then we can, we can have this in our minds as, as we progress throughout the presentation. Uh, 
So I go to a lot of PHP conferences and I would like to know in code procedurally whether or not a speaker is attending a conference. So actually at PHP Bulgaria, which is where I gave this talk last time, uh, I decided that the use case would be, can I have free beer at the party? And I decided I was going to calculate this in code by making a HTTP request to the PHP Bulgaria website and checking for the words beer, party, or a list of other things, and then it would return true if it, if it found it. But I couldn't find anything on the PHP NANT website, on the PHP Tor website, so I had to completely change this use case, which is unfortunate. So whatever. Uh, it's a little more professional now, so I want to know if a speaker is coming to a conference, whatever. So the very first thing I've done is, is defined an interface. Everyone knows what an interface is. It's a contract. The aim is that the concrete that fulfills this contract will uh, return whether or not this, uh, this speaker is speaking at conference will return true or false, depending on whether there is a speaker or not. Um, so now we have to decide how we're going to fulfill this, this concrete contract, right? So of course, the PHP Tor website has no API. So I'm going to do something which should be illegal, I think, in my opinion, uh, called web scraping, which is what I did for PHP Bulgaria website as well. So we're going to make a HTTP request from our server to the PHP Tor site. We're going to grab all the HTML, scan it for the speaker's name, and then uh, and that's it. And that will, will return true or false. That's going to be our implementation for now. So to download the data, we're going to use a HTTP client that everyone probably knows. It's called Guzzle. has really simple methods called uh, get or post to retrieve data. It's very popular. So there's no best practices right now. This is just straight away shoving procedural code in a class and, and, and proving that it works. So a very brief walkthrough, I've created this class, PHP Tor 2017. Uh, it implements the method that the conference interface states that you must. Um, and at the very top here, we're instantiating these objects. So we're instantiating the Guzzle HTTP client DOM document, which is already available in PHP by default. Um, and then we're making the HTTP request using Guzzle request get URL. I think this is still the modern API for this. I think it's still up to date. So it's basically the same API calls. Um, we're loading the result of that into DOM documents, so it passes it into a big tree so we can search for it. And then we're using DOM XPath to, uh, to run an XPath search on that. And XPath is awesome. You, I think in Chrome, you can even do a dollar symbol and then X at the bottom in the console, and then you can run an XPath query to, to search for stuff. Um, and the, the XPath contains this function called text, which means it's going to search through all the text nodes and uh, look for something that contains, and in this case, the speaker name. This works. Nobody can call my bullshit on this. I, I've, I've tested this. Um, and it basically finds any node that contains the speaker text and returns whether or not there are any. That's, that's our implementation of a conference object. But what's, what's wrong with this code? It works, you know, you, it, it looks okay, I guess. We've instantiated objects towards the top. It has a nice flow. It's small. What's wrong with it? Let's say I give this code to another developer in, an, in another project. In order for them to work with it, they're going to have to scan through. They're going to see, okay, you know, there's, there's overhead cognitive overhead or whatever it's called here. I'm going to create a Guzzle object here, the DOM document object here. The DOM, do, DOM document is built into PHP by default, so it's considered really a, a newable, but, uh, and it's not going anywhere outside of the class. But with Guzzle, because it's a third-party library, this is called coupling. Our object cannot exist in isolation. It requires other objects in itself to work, and it's responsible for creating and handling the life cycle of this other object. In some instances, that may be okay, but You've got to bear in mind that if we want to use this HTTP client somewhere else, we're going to also instantiate it somewhere else. So multiple classes are going to instantiate this, uh, this, this object. It's going to be used multiple times throughout the application. And if you're doing simple CRUD Laravel apps, that's maybe it's OK for you. But when you start going into big enterprise stuff, you don't want to be repeatedly instantiating an object from you. You want to be able to pass it through an application because you don't want to waste resources. You may see some people say this is hard to test, but they never explain why it's hard to test. So we're going to write a test now. This is just to get everyone onto the same page before we go into the real meat of it. And I'm going to show you why it's hard to test. So we've created this test, this, uh, this test PHP Tor 2017 objects that extends PHP unit framework test case. Um, obviously, every single person in here writes tests. So I'm just doing this to make sure you know, we're all on the same page. But just in case one person doesn't, this is, this is how you typically write a test. The setup method here is called on each iteration of a test. And then the actual test that's executed is test time supposed to be here, seriously. And all we're doing is calling the interface methods of our objects with, uh, with the name of the person who's, uh, running, who's we're looking for. And then we're asserting true, which is part of the PHP unit stuff, that, uh, that we, we get true back. That's it. It's a positive test. And it works as well. 
But there's something very wrong with the code, and that's if, if for some reason the guzzle object fails, and I don't just mean if it throws an exception, because we can catch that exception in our code and handle it, so it's, it's all okay. If guzzle, say, sec faults, or if it encounters a, a fatal error because of some bad code there, then our object fails as well, and there's not really anything we can do about that, apart from maybe in PHP 7 where we can handle fatals, but it's, it's basically, that's what coupling is. We have to be able to test our object on its individual merits and not on Guzzle's merits as well. So currently this is actually an integration test because it's making a live HTTP call to test this. So if we're writing good code, we should be able to store or fake the data that Guzzle provides to us so we can test how our object responds as a result with different data sets. So the point is we need to manipulate inputs and show expected outputs that we should expect from, from these objects, which leads me to this. If your unit test is making a network call, it's not a unit test. And we're not talking about where some one person could go, oh, a unit could be a package, or it could, we're just talking on an object basis for this. It's not a unit test, it's an integration test. And, and this is just an example. If it interacts with other services that you also basically testing those services, well, it's coupling. So there's a much better way to do this, and it's really simple. So instead of our conference object creating Guzzle, it's upper layer that the object is created and it's passed in. And so we're asking for these objects. Really simple, we're asking for these objects via type hints, and it's the act of passing those in, like the calling coders at the bottom, that is dependency injection. So the dependent dependency injection is the action that we actually do. So doing this provides us with something called inversion of control. This is almost literally what happened with my motorcycle accident, by the way. <laughs> inversion of control means we're literally inverting the relationship between our object and other objects and third-party objects and libraries. So that's what we gain from using dependency injection. So I've mentioned two things so far, dependency injection and inversion of control. So just to clarify before we move further how these two are different, the old way is that an object finds the object it needs for itself or creates it and then calls it. And I've put finds here because we do move on to, to finding objects later on. And the new way is you just hand the dependency to the object when it's created. Now it's really easy to say this, but when you're using a framework and it's, we're constantly saying we need to move back a layer, we need to move back a layer, how far the, how the hell far do we go back, you know? So I'll talk about that in a bit. But if we do this, we can test our object on our own merits and not on Guzzle's merits as well. So let's have a look at what a test could look like now. Really quickly, um, when we call get contents from the uh, from get body get contents, which you can see at the bottom of the page, um, we're saying that Guzzle will return this HTML. And then all we're saying is that we, we pass this fake client to our object instead of the actual HTTP client. Our actual object calls our fake Guzzle client instead and then receives this, and then we're asserting true that we actually get back a true for this. So this is an example of a positive test with a, a faked out, um, fake response from Guzzle. <clears throat> this is just a positive test, like I said before, you could do the same with a negative one, which is where we don't have the speaker's name in there, and we would expect that it returns false, because you need to test that. You need to test that your object does respond as you expect it to, if it doesn't encounter what it's looking for. So dependency injection is all about control. Control in code so that control is inverted and control in tests so we can fake inputs of this black box and e get expected outputs. It's the same as a HTTP API. So fast forward six months later and I decide that I want to view conference speaker history who spoke at last year's PHP Bulgaria conference instead, for example. The website for those conferences might not even exist anymore. They might have changed it. I will exist. It's a great conference. You should all go to it. But maybe, uh, maybe they've updated the page and they don't have those speakers' names from 2016 anymore. Instead, let's say I personally have stored the, the speakers from 2016 in a database. Imagine we're using and instantiating this conference object multiple times throughout the application. How easy would it be to substitute our object that currently makes a horrible web scrape to the PHP Tor website and instead reads from the DB? For, uh, for PHP Bulgaria. This is where interfaces, abstractions, and the D in solid come into play. So back to solid, uh, D stands for the dependency inversion principle, and the main takeaway is that basically the dependency inversion principle states objects should depend on abstractions, not concretes. It's not complicated, it's the easiest thing to understand, really simple, and it, this could be an interface or an abstract class, that's it. Depend on an interface or an abstract class, boom, you've hit the dependency inversion principle, nothing more complicated than that. So if we go back and look at IOC, we can see these are two different things. So inversion of control is where uh, we invert the control and the relationship between objects that need to use it and the object that creates it, and we give it, we do this through dependency injection. So this is what we gain and what we do to achieve that. 
Dependency inversion is just depending on abstractions rather than, uh, rather than concretes. So you can do all these three things at once really easily. So let's assume we're using a typical MVC, and I've deliberately done the quotes there because we all know MVC doesn't actually exist in PHP in its classical form, um, but MVC-esque framework in, uh, in PHP that has the concept of a controller. The controller point typically is where developers start to add their work and add new functionality to a code base, right? <laughs> So if, a, if our controller asks for a conference interface, we can give it whatever we want as long as it implements conference. So a really simple class diagram. We've got our controller here in the top left that's asking for a conference, and uh, the conference interface has a concrete implementation that is PHP Tor 2017 that uses the Guzzle HTTP client. We can do exactly the same. We just add another class, PHP Bulgaria 2016, that implements the conference interface. And then we can switch these out instead. So we're depending on an abstraction like an interface so we can substitute other objects whenever we want. And this is what polymorphism is. So clearly the best thing that I can show now is a definition of polymorphism from one of the most trusted sites on the internet that I should be giving at a professional conference, and that's Wikipedia. And that states polymorphism is the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. We've got a single interface. We've got entities of different types. Exactly the same thing. So we've done it, right, just by having this conference interface. This is exactly what we're doing. So we can substitute different types. So how we choose to substitute that is up to you. And that's where it's hard. That's where people end typically here. They just say, yeah, you can substitute different types. You've got polymorphism, great. But how do you, how do, you do it? You know? So you can decide which class to instantiate at runtime. While the application's running, you could have a factory. You could switch depending on, say, an environment variable or something to, say, create this object that implements this interface or create this object that implements this interface, whatever. Um, or you can decide at compile time. Again, I've used quotes because PHP isn't compiled fully, obviously. It's mostly interpreted. Um, where you could read from a configuration file that's read from at the beginning of the application in the bootstrap, and then you choose which one to instantiate from that. You could also uh, utilize the strategy pattern uh, combined with an abstract factory to solve this solution where you've got two objects of the same interface that you need to construct that have different constructor parameters required, for example. So you're just separating out how you create these in two separate factories. But there are, there are easier ways to go about this, and I go into this later. So a very simple recap of the basics before we move on to the, so we're all on the same page. Uh, dependency injection is simply passing in object dependencies. You pass them in instead of instantiating them in the object. Doing this gives you inversion of control, so it's no longer the object creating these things. It's handling the life cycle of these objects. Unless it's a factory, this is, this is not what we're talking about. If you don't do this, other people will hate you because they can't easily mock out your code because it's using all this other stuff. And using interfaces, we can adhere to the dependency inversion principle and depend on abstractions, basically polymorphism. And I haven't really touched on this too much, but I'm going to, and that's code always starts off in a procedural section, always, and we build up objects from that area. So when someone says they do object-oriented programming, there's still going to be some procedural section at the beginning of your code base that orchestrates and, and creates all these things and makes them talk to each other. So we're constantly saying we have to move back a level to instantiate an object, to pass it in, right? How, how far do we have to move back, seriously? When developers start out, they typically move back to the controller layer because that's where they start working, and that's where they create their new objects and start orchestrating things from there. But the proper answer of where we're supposed to move back to is we're supposed to move back all the way back to the bootstrap, effectively, where we create our code. So in Java has a main method, typically, where you could do this if you're not using a framework, and that's what's hit first. PHP has its index.php, which is where we can start we require our autoloader and we start creating our objects there that talk to each other. So we can kind of look at how we do this. And let's look at our controller example from, uh, from the uh, class diagram that we had before. So in most frameworks, like I said, to add a new feature, <coughs> as a developer, you go to the controller, you'll create a controller, you'll register it as a root, and then you will, uh, you'll, you'll write code like this. So I'm looking at this class diagram piece at the top and we're creating our actual controller. So here we're saying that the controller itself requires a conference interface. So the typical thing is as soon as you start registering this, um, you start doing this on the actual controller itself, it won't just work. You'll try and run this code and it'll fail. And, uh, and it's really easy and understandable. Probably half of you understand why it fails, but I'm going I'm to explain why. So the typical layout of an application, like I said before, is you in the composition route where you, where you create your objects and tell them to talk to each other is at the beginning where your objects are built. 
Then the framework creates, uh, converts the URL from the request, includes any super globals, and then creates the controller in action. It's def usually defined in like a mapping file, which is your roots.yml in Symfony. And finally, the controller object is created and the method uh, is executed, and you do whatever you want from then on. That's where you, as a developer, start start working really. So. There's, this is a very sim very simplified example, but not too far off of the part of the framework that will start building this controller and action and running it. And it could be called a controller resolver. In fact, I know in Silex, it was actually called a controller resolver. Um, this is what we do. We, we get the strings, con controller, which is the thing we're trying to instantiate, and the conference action, which is the method we're supposed to be running. So we've got these two things. And then you'll have this code here, it returns a new controller and executes the action with pro any parameters. If this was actually part of the framework code that executed right now and we had that conference interface in a controller constructor, this will fatal. It'll say we must be passing a conference interface to that controller and it's not being passed. Why is that not being passed? Well, this is where dependency injection containers typically come in, these big boxes which the framework uses to hold a load of crap in, which is terrible. Um, basically, we register a load of things that need to be pulled out at this point for this controller. So we would have to state this controller requires this object here and as strings we will pass it in. So the old arbitrary way that Symfony used to do this, is, this is quite a few years ago now, was that you would register, it might even be, it still exist, but it might have just had been deprecated or something, but we used to say that the HTTP client string would be an instance of guzzle HTTP slash client and then the controller requires this HTTP class client. That's, uh, that's basically how we would do it previously. So there's another way of doing it. The controller could extend a base controller, which one that only couples you to the framework, which you really shouldn't be doing anyway. But um, we're using this method called get container from this base class, which means that that container where we've registered these things, we have access to it on our controllers because the framework is giving it to our controller. It's just, it's just a, like a, a key value pair storage, really. That's all it is. And then we can pull out that value conference, which gives us the conference object. So that's one way of doing it, and I don't want to be one of these people that say, don't do something, and then don't give a reason why, um, because you'll always get one person in the audience who says something like, oh, use go to because it uses one less freaking op code. Okay, no, don't, seriously. There's, this isn't, that's an edge case. There's always an edge case, but as a general rule of thumb, don't couple yourself to the framework and pull things out of a container, because this is called an anti-pattern. Now, if anyone's thinking this might not be an anti-pattern in certain use cases, you're the go to person, don't do that. Um, you could use something called encapsulated context, which is still something that I'm not particularly a fan of, but this is known as a service locator, and it's an anti-pattern. Why is it an anti-pattern? Because imagine you're making calls to a HTTP API. that You don't know how to do it, so you look at the documentation. The documentation states, we need this from you in the JSON body or whatever, and we give you this back. They don't, you don't care how it does it, it just does it. So it's the same with an object API. Your public methods of an interface and your concrete class are just its API for the object. All that people need should be visible from the constructor and method signatures only. So as soon as you use this container thing somewhere else, they're going to have to go through all the code and understand exactly what's being pulled out where and all the coupling and all this stuff. So no scanning line by line for your code. It makes it hard for others to mock. And most importantly, these aren't my words, but it makes a liar of your object API. So your object API is lying. So frameworks use containers typically or previously for dependency injection. And this diagram shows how we can build and register objects in a dependency injection container in the bootstrap. It's the composition or creation and wiring or the definition and registration of how these objects talk to each other and passed into each other that's known as the object graph. When you wire your objects to together, you're basically saying how they're instantiated and what they're instantiated with. That's the wiring and how they're injected into each other. Rather like the container registering that I showed earlier. Your framework will then use the dependency injection container typically in that control resolver section, depending on how they separate the responsibilities, which Symfony doesn't really do very well. Um, so it knows what controller requires what objects and it instantiates them. And then finally, the developer can create the controller, register the root, um, and then type in for objects they have manually registered uh, in the dependency injection container at the beginning. So the dependency injection container typically is this god black box that holds all this, all this stuff for you. So at this point, a few years ago, in, in larger apps, I've seen the sheer number of dependencies get completely out of hand. 
having massive registration of every single controller, every single object, every single dependency, all the wiring and everything became a nightmare. At this point, I thought there's got to be a better way of doing things. And this is where I discovered automatic dependency injection. And the idea with AutoDI is that something in the code base reads object signatures for the things you're about to create and then creates them, but it does that via introspection. And recur it recursively instantiates each object in the graph that you require um, without much effort from the developer. And introspection can be performed in PHP with reflection. So reflection, this is the only funny cat gif with, uh, with reflection in Google. But it allows you to, in code, uh, read anything about a class, which includes method, constructor parameters, um, it includes PHP dot blocks, whatever the hell you want. So here's some code at the part of the framework where the controller has created the controller resolver that could use this information. So note at the top of the controller here, this is the controller constructor at the very top of the code. Uh, we're asking for a concrete object, Bulgaria PHP 2016. So we're creating this new reflection class halfway down on the controller string, which is looking at the controller object itself. And then we're looping through the constructor parameters of this controller, and we're pulling out the string, which is the class it's asking for. And we literally get the string, in this case, Bulgaria PHP 2016, for that code at the top. We can instantiate objects from strings, right? So with that, we can do the same with, uh, we can instantiate the object, and we can do the same with any other objects that it requires as well. So if we have multiple objects here, say Bulgaria PHP 2016, memcache, whatever, it, these will be created as long as they don't have their own dependencies with this exact code and injected for you when, the, when it's instantiated using this uh, dot 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 injector params at the bottom. So we're looping through these parameters, creating them in an array, and then passing those objects in as, a, as an expanded array to the controller itself. So it's really simple. This is automatic injection. You remove a parameter, it doesn't get picked up here, it doesn't get instantiated, the string doesn't get instantiated. This is a really simple example. So you can type hint for one object that requires another etc and another etc in its constructor. How the hell do you have them all provisioned and injected for you automatically? Because this was only one layer of objects deep. This is where you get into magic. This is where you get into things with uh, the recursive instantiation, caching all these things so it's not slow. Some people think it's magic, but if it's part of the infrastructure layer, of, of which most of the framework does magic stuff anyway, and you're not coupling yourself to the framework, then it's okay to leverage a little bit of that. My problem personally comes with when you're, uh, you're using magic from a framework and it's encouraged, and that is used directly in the non-infrastructure layer of your code in your actual application logic, and that's where it's a nightmare because it intentionally, the framework opinionatedly, intentionally couples yourself to it, and that's a bad thing. So if it's just part of the infrastructure and the stuff that's loaded at the beginning, then if it's unit tested as well and it covers all the edge cases <coughs> and a lot of people use it, then, then it's okay. There are still problems with it though. What happens if, with the pre code previously, the automatic injection that we've seen, you ask for an interface, but you're not giving it a concrete? It doesn't work because it will find the string conference, it will try and instantiate conference, which is an interface, and it will fail. So we still get this catchable fatal error here at the bottom. One way about that is binding or aliasing. And this is where we say, when we encounter this interface, instantiate this concrete instead. So the only difference here is this array key exists from the code. Look at the second red bullet point kind of thing here. If the array key exists for conference, so we encounter conference, we're going to instantiate the Bulgaria PHP 2016 object instead. You can read this from a configuration file, which is how Symfony kind of does it. It reads from a YAML file instead, instead of this mapping here. It creates that mapping from the configuration file, and then you just change one string in the configuration file and it will instantiate another object instead. There's still problems with this, though. What about if Bulgaria PHP 2016 or PHP Tor, Tor has its own constructor objects which have their own constructor objects, that recursive problem? What if, with about circular dependencies, what if object A requires object B, or an object B requires an instance of object A? Now you can either go away and figure this out yourself, and I highly recommend you do, including trying to build your own framework so you know why you're doing it in the first place, but just please don't use it in production or at any company. Uh, or you can try and use a library that already does this for you. Now, there are many libraries that do this. Um, one at the time, which I used and have used for a while, that has the most feature complete set, which I've seen, is Auron. There's also PHPDI and other stuff, and frameworks even do this now. But Auron is a dependency injector that provides uh, 
automatic recursive dependency instantiation that allows us to wire the object graph up. Uh, so we can do our code so it adheres to solid, we can write our code so it adheres to solid, and then hook it in using this, but we're not coupled to it, that's the important thing. And so it was written by a really cool guy called Daniel Lowry, the same guy that got the TLS peer verification RFC through MPHP, so he kind of knows what he's doing, and it's named after Oren from the uh, Never Ending Story. So this code is exactly the same as the code before, but you could use PHPDI or Oren for this. Um, this is where we're telling the injector to make the controller, which in the background is doing all that uh, instantiation for us. We don't need to do it this ourselves. And then we can call execute, which is basically a, the same recursive instantiation for object methods. So met methods that require objects, this will be passed in for you as well. These, these things will be passed in recursively for you. So right now, this will read the signature of the controller, read the signature of the Bulgaria PHP 2016 conference object, find it needs guzzle, instantiate guzzle, then it will pass that into the Bulgaria object, then it will pass that into our conference object. And it will instantiate the conference object inside for the controller. So as a result, if we had that previous code literally right there and we asked for memcache, so li literally you would add memcache to your controller constructor and it will instantiate that and give it to the controller as a result. So you could then remove memcache and then it won't give it to it anymore. So you can add these things really fast. It's rapid application development. So we've already shown this with our code earlier. Uh, we can do this at will throughout the whole application because everything comes from the controller one point and then expands into your different layers, your controller layer, your domain layer, whatever the hell these layers you want to call it. Um, and because everything is wired at this one point, you can build it every, however the hell you want. What about an interface? We had this mapping method before, this mapping array that we looped through. Well, this is exactly the same with Oren or PHPDI. You say, when we encounter this conference interface, inject this Bulgaria PHP 2016 concrete object. Now, I love YAML. I think it's awesome. I'll fight and die by it. I'm ready, ready for your attacks on YAML at the end. But here is, for example, a YAML config. The conference object is, uh, is, is against the PHP Bulgaria 2016 object. And what we can do then is we can literally change between Nantes and, uh, Nantes and Bulgaria and instantiate those at will instead. So we're calling alias on whatever that is, and it will loop through it. So this is typically how PHP and, and Symfony will do this. Because in Symfony 3.3, we've got um, auto wire types, I think, which allows us to specify a concrete to uh, a, a, uh, an interface implementation, an interface to a concrete implementation. Same as this, basically. So the developer can then go in, create a new class, change configuration if they need to, because it automatically injects concretes for you, for us. So only if we need configuration. So we've removed one step through this, and then have it passed in uh, polymorphically. So you remember this, this terrible diagram? Well, now as a dev, you can build the relationships in the configuration file, or however you want to. Your injector will read from the configuration file and create the controller and its dependencies recursively. So you as a dev can focus on, uh, on building the objects where you need to most, uh, away from the framework, hook the objects in so you're not coupled to the framework, and the result is you're not coupled to the container or the framework, you can remove or refactor these classes at any time and continue and concentrate on writing your solid code that's not part of this. How is this better than manual registration, though? So with manual registration, like I said, you have to register everything manual, obviously, or do this through factories and, and all that sort of stuff. And you can still do it with factories for edge cases where you need to give one thing to one thing and the same type to another. But we can do auto-injection for concretes, that does it automatically, and you're not going to interface everything in, application, in your application. Unless your domain requires it, you're going to have one HTTP client. And you really, unless you're super hardcore, you're not going to build a, an anti-corruption layer around a HTTP client that works. So you're just going to type in for a HTTP client, you'll get it. You can also have uh, auto-injection for interfaces. So we have, if, if we have a single concrete available, even if you ask for an interface, we could be reading from the composer autoloader to see uh, what concrete exists. I think this is how Symphony 3.3 does this sort of stuff, maybe. Um, and then it will use that to, uh, to instantiate <coughs> it. So only when you've got two concretes do you actually need to specify, we're going to choose between these two. You can alias and bind an interface to a concrete, as I've said many times now. And there are edge cases for specifying instances for specific modules, and you can do this as well. What are the downsides? You can't just have a massive legacy code base and easily put this in. So you need to choose that this is the right tool for the job at the beginning of the application. Um, so when you're building your project from scratch, this needs to be part of the infrastructure of it. Also, people say reflection is slow. Yes, it is. 
But if you can cache these things, like, like Composer's autoloader minus O does for production, and Auron caches by default. So this is not a new concept in uh, Java. Java has Spring. Objective-C has uh, Typhoon. Uh, C-sharp has type interception for Unity. There's probably newer versions now. Obviously, there's Auron for PHP and PHPDI. So a quick recap of what we've gone over. Your objects should specify external requirements needed in their constructor and method signatures. Dependency injection is simply passing in parameters. It's just the action of doing it that gives you all these benefits. Use interfaces for things that might change. That gives you polymorphism. And depend on abstractions rather than concretes. So compose your object graph at the very beginning. Use, use interfaces for your concretes and adhere to the dependency inversion principle. So where next could we go with automated DI? So I know some of you have heard of uh, AOP. There's a lot of people that like it. There's, in fact, uh, an AOP talk here, I think, that you should probably go to. We could normally use the decorate, decorator pattern to handle some of these cross-cutting concerns. So we've got our controller at the top that does our standard uh, has speaker action. We've also got a controller logger that we've created. So we use the underscore underscore call magic method of this logger. We pass in the controller to the constructor of it, so we're, we're wrapping it. And then uh, when we call controller logger method, it directs that through and delegates it through to the actual controller itself. But then on either side of that, we can do logging and debugging. Now, obviously, the decorator pattern allows you to do debugging outside of the object itself. If you wanted to do it inside, then you could use the observer pattern. And then if you don't give it anything to, to log, then it, it just tries to call an empty array of observers. That's fine. But this is how we could do this manually in our code. So in 2013, there was anonymous classes by Joe Watkins. He did the uh, anonymous classes RFC that was implemented in PHP 7 that allows you to write code like this. An anonymous class, exactly the same as the thing before, except that we don't instantiate it for every single object that we want to log. We just do it for specific ones, and it can take any arbitrary object. I think there's an RFC open now for, for arbitrary objects as well, so I'm hoping that goes through, because this will help with this. But really, we've just shown the decorator inside this. We can write something for the injector that I showed before that can take advantage of this. For those people who love annotations, don't ever speak to me again. But I realize you can do this if you want to. Here's an arbitrary example of what we could put in a PHP doc comment, saying we're going to decorate this with the logger that we saw previously. And you could do this in any way you wanted, but uh, if you really wanted to, you could do the exact same decoration before. If the method from this uh, using reflection, if the doc comment contains at logger decorate, then we will automatically wrap it with our automatic logger and then, and then do that. So really, you can. this means that any method with decorate logger in the PHP doc will automatically be logged, depending on how your framework sets this up. You could even go a step further, read from configuration files to, f to see what decorations are available, make your own AOP-style framework. Just an example of where you can go with, with PHP 7 and things like this. So how can you apply this? Choose a framework that supports automatic recursive DI if you think it's the right tool for the job and you want rapid application development. Choose a micro framework or components that will allow you to substitute this controller resolver, like uh, Silex 1.4, I think, or whatever it was, had controller.resolver as the object you can override, so you can literally just slap in this, uh, this uh, auto-resolver. If you have a legacy code base, you don't have to use a, a, an automatic injector. Just design your interfaces so that you can pass things in easily. You can swap them easily. That's the point. And make this a primary consideration for, for, your, uh, for your next software architecture project. So current framework solutions, Symfony has auto-wire true as of version 2.8. Auto-wiring types as of 3.3, which is where we alias uh, interfaces to concrete. So that's really cool. There's also the uh, awesome Douglas Action Bundle, which is automatic registration of controllers and services, which I don't know if it's made it into the core of, P of, of Symfony, but it really should, because then that would remove the manual controllers to services registration when there effectively should be services anyway um, in the Symfony description of wording, and other frameworks have it out of the box. Like I said, micro frameworks like Silex allow you to replace this, so you have this controller resolver and you can put your own injector in there to do this sort of stuff. So there's some books that I really recommend. These were really useful for me. Take a look at the design patterns and the clean coder book, not particularly related to this, but I just like to show people some of the awesome things you can read. Um, this community is one of the best out there. You should definitely leverage all the help you can get. Go on Stack Overflow, accept the pain, and then the future help that you'll get from Stack Overflow, and it really will help. 
And I think I have a little, I have five minutes left for talk according to this, so uh, please feel free to ask any questions and, and leave me terrible feedback. Thank you. Does anyone want to berate me? Any questions? Have some water now. No question? I think I covered my ass enough to say that you don't have to do this, so no one can say that you shouldn't. So I, that's why I'm seeing some people haven't put their hands up. That's good. Nope. Okay. Thank you.